Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's one o'clock on Thursday afternoon. Uh, I hope everybody, I'm sorry, it's two o'clock on Thursday afternoon. I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, a lot has happened in our world in the last week uh, since we uh, had our last conference. Uh, I hope you're still staying safe and uh, uh, following all the precautions that, that, that seem to be working for everybody. Uh, I had said last week that I wanted to do uh, a part two of, uh, of our discussion uh, from last week, and I'm glad that we're doing this because there have been a lot of changes since uh, last Thursday. Uh, would, I'd like to review again the primary reason why um, I'm holding these uh, virtual seminars. It's because people are home. A lot of people have not done their estate planning. We've received a lot of phone calls and emails from people that are anxious and fearful as to what may happen uh, because of these, this pandemic. And a lot of people think that they can't do their estate planning and they're in a position of despair. Uh, when we spoke last Thursday, I informed everyone that that was untrue. There are ways to do your estate planning at home. You do not need to leave your house. And last Thursday when we spoke, I educated everybody about a, an executive order that Governor Cuomo had signed, allowing for the remote notarization of documents. So if we're able to see you by video using the technology that we're using right now, you can sign your documents and if we follow proper procedures that are new procedures by virtue of the executive order, we can notarize your documents remotely. At that time, the government or the governor had only spoken as to notarizations. And in the world of estate planning, when you're dealing with wills and powers of attorney and healthcare proxies, those documents require witnesses. So there's a difference between notarizing somebody's signature and witnessing somebody sign a document. New York state law requires that there be witnesses for these documents. And as of last Thursday, uh, we didn't have any guidance as to whether we can remotely witness the signing of your documents. Just the other day, Governor Cuomo signed another executive order. And I had said last Thursday that I thought that might happen. And it did. Governor Cuomo now signed an executive order that allows for the remote witnessing of documents. So we can now remotely witness the signing of your will, your power of attorney, your health care proxy. And we can attend to the remote notarization of those documents, which completes the package. So this executive order was extremely important and it allows us to really move forward now on all eight cylinders and represent you without you even having to leave the comforts of your home. And I think that's really important because we're here to help. We're fully functioning. We are working remotely, but it's been about three weeks now and we're getting accustomed to it, and we have our, our legs underneath us. And so we're perfectly capable of having telephone consultations, exchanging information by email, and drafting your documents while we're in the comforts of our own home. We don't have to come into the office either. And for those of you that are scared, uh, you should not be sitting at home without documents going forward. You should take proper measures to reach out to us or some other law firm, and even at a minimum, put together a power of attorney and or a last will and testament. It doesn't take great effort to do those things. And I think we all know somebody <clears throat> that, may has, that may have lost their capacity by virtue of this virus or may have passed on by virtue of this virus. So we should at least do something 
to put in a stop gap measure if you don't want to take the time to do a full estate plan and we can circle back later on. But it's extremely important and I think you would agree that something should be done. If something happens, the consequences can be grave. Now, the law changed in other areas since last week, and I'm going to talk about those last, but the law changed in terms of Medicaid eligibility. And somebody posted a question last week about look-back periods, and I'll talk about that at the end when I discuss the changes to the Medicaid laws, which ultimately are going to necessitate you coming into this office and doing your planning. Uh, we would always lecture and preach to the clientele that you should not be waiting to do your planning. And part of that might be a sales pitch, but a lot of it is because the rules are becoming more and more stringent. And now the rules have become even more stringent. Things that we were able to do in the past with relative ease, are becoming more difficult, and I'll explain that in a moment. So now that we can fully function remotely and attend to the execution of your documents, I want to remind everyone what those documents are. Some of the basic documents, but they should not be treated lightly, would be your health care proxy and your power of attorney. It's insufficient to draft a power of attorney off the internet. If you drafted a power of attorney and you were working with a real estate attorney or a general practitioner, I have nothing against those attorneys. But I don't do real estate. It's because all I do is elder law and estate planning. I don't dabble in other areas. The technicalities behind the documents and the planning techniques that we work with on a regular basis have even become burdensome to some of us that do this every day. It's nearly impossible to dabble in these areas. So if you have a power of attorney that's been drafted by a non-elder law attorney, you should really act quickly to have it reviewed by an elder law attorney, and most likely it's going to need to be redrafted. The reason being is that a power of attorney in its bare state, in other words, that you can get off the internet or the statutory form of a power of attorney, it's got your basic provisions in it, but it doesn't have modifications. The modifications are what an elder law attorney adds. And those modifications are extremely important. They're items that we learned over 20 years of practice. For instance, the power to gift your assets. We need to put that into a power of attorney. Now you might be saying, Sal, I don't want you to be able to give my, give my assets, or I don't, I don't want my kids to be able to give my assets away. That's not the point. That's not the purpose. The purpose is, be, is to be able to move your assets around between family members or even non-family members for planning purposes. For instance, if you fall ill and need to go into a nursing home or if you need home care. The modification to create trust, the modification to do certain types of Medicaid planning, all of those, and that's what we consider to be a good power of attorney. Power of attorney also needs to have a statutory gifts rider. Statutory gifts rider is a separate document that needs to be signed and it's not easy to sign the document, it needs to be initialed in a bunch of different spots. And that document allows for the gift giving and the change of your beneficial interests and in IRAs and things like that. So we come to you with these recommendations, not just to pick up new clients and sell ourselves. I can't express to you with any more sincerity. And maybe that's a scare, but is is ever more now with what we're watching on TV and listening to on the radio. You need to do your estate planning. It needs to be done the right way. And we're here to help you. If it's not us, find somebody. Just do it. 
That's the message that we're trying to get across to everyone. It's extremely important to put your affairs in order, not because we think or you think you might die tomorrow, but there are so many uncertainties, especially now, that can take your entire estate plan and turn it upside down and really wreak havoc on your family from an emotional and a financial perspective. If what's going on in today's society does not convince you, then I don't know what will. My lectures won't convince you. My good work won't convince you. TV and media won't convince you. And I hope that you take my advice seriously. After the basic documents, you want to consider a last will and testament and or a revocable living trust. Most people have wills. The problem today with wills is that they go through probate. So if you have a house and bank accounts and brokerage accounts, when you die, your heirs have to take your will and they've got to go to surrogate's court and they have to go through a process to get the executor appointed by the court. Until that happens, the executor has no power or has very limited power. That takes time. It could be costly. If you own property outside of New York State, you have to do it in that state as well as New York. But with this pandemic, the courts are closed. And who knows what they're going to look like when they come back. I spoke to a clerk the other day. He said, <clears throat> you know, we don't know when we're going to go back to being able to function. They're starting to think about remotely opening the courts. <clears throat> but that's not going to be uh, productive, if you would. You've got an original last will and testament that needs to be delivered to the court. Uh, you've got other original documents. What if there needs to be a hearing? So we anticipate that the courts are going to be backlogged for quite some time. And that has nothing to do with the credibility of the courts. It's just, it is what it is. Uh, I recently had the opportunity to speak to a funeral director who's telling me that they're approaching hundreds of deaths in one month. So this is going to wreak havoc on the, on the legal system. If you want to avoid probate, you should be thinking about a revocable living trust. We're doing a lot of them these days. There's many reasons why you might want to consider a revocable trust. But one of the primary reasons is because it avoids probate. If we prepare your estate plan by using a revocable living trust, it says the same thing that your will says. But your assets need to be transferred to your trust where you'll be the trustee initially. So for instance, if you own a house, we would set up the trust. You would be the trustee of the trust. And then we would take your house and put it into the trust. Now your house is owned by your revocable trust. So that way when you die, or if you become incapacitated, the trust governs. And somebody can take over and manage the assets of the trust. Or they can just administer your estate after death. And this is all without going to court. This is without the probate proceeding. That's a big deal. That's a, a really big deal for a lot of people. So I want you to think about a revocable living trust. It may not be for everybody. It's not a one size fits all. And that's one of the problems that you'll see out there by a lot of attorneys who might be doing seminars, online programs. It's not for everyone. But in today's climate, it's for a lot of people. So I want you to consider that, and you can ask us more about that. Finally, at some point, and usually once you start to approach the 60s and 70s, you should be thinking about protecting your assets. What happens if you need to go into a nursing home? What happens if you need home care? You should be thinking about protecting the assets so that way they're not used, at least in their entirety, to pay for those costs, which are extremely expensive today. The average nursing home is about $15,000 a month. So to do that, we draft trust on a regular basis. We call them Medicaid trust. And these trusts carry a five-year look-back period. So you have to do it 
you know, when you have time, you know, it's not a good idea to wait until you're elderly, if you would. And they don't work when you go into a nursing home because we don't have the five years anymore. Medicaid trusts are becoming the staple product of an elder law attorney's office. It's one of the few ways that I can protect your assets with advanced planning. There are other ways to protect assets, but if we want to work in advance and put everything in order so that way you could sleep at night and enjoy your family, enjoy your life, a Medicaid trust is what you should be talking to us about. If you don't have a Medicaid trust, there are other options to pay for your long-term care, but we're not seeing them used with, you know, by many people. Long-term care insurance is one of them. Privately paying for your care is another. But most people are opting for the Medicaid trust. So you have to talk about a power of attorney. You have to talk about a health care proxy, a last will and testament, and maybe a revocable trust, and also a Medicaid trust. That's what your estate planning should look like. It should not be limited to just a basic will. It should not be limited to just a health care proxy. You should really sit down with an attorney that does this every day and get it done. How do you know that you're choosing the right attorney? Research that person. Go on my website. Plan today for tomorrow. All spelled out. Plan today for tomorrow. You'll see that I've spent an inordinate amount of time writing articles and blogs and lecturing. There's all different kinds of topics that you can read. And I wrote almost all of that. My associate, Joanna Feldman, may have wrote some of the blogs too. But you're getting a personal touch from us. We're the ones that are giving you the information. Don't just hire somebody because your friend used them. Don't just hire somebody because you drive past their office every day in town. Do your research. There's not many of us out there. There's enough, but there's not many elder law and estate planning attorneys out there. But there are a lot of attorneys out there that tell you they can help you when they do a little bit of a lot of different things. And that is not productive, at least in this particular area of practice. Now, I mentioned before that the laws changed in the world of Medicaid planning. It's important for you to know, and this may not affect everyone, that starting October 1st, there's now going to be a two and a half year look back period for home care purposes. What is home care? Home care is where somebody stays at home, perhaps they have a cognitive impairment, and they need care, they need an aid. They need somebody to be with them six, seven, eight hours a day, or maybe it's 24-hour care. And we do a lot of that in this office. We try not to send somebody to a nursing home, or we're not the ones that are sending you to a nursing home, but we try to plan and try to do everything we can with the family to avoid nursing home stays. And we do so by trying to utilize home care services. It used to be that there was no look back period for home care. Even right now, in you know, we're still digesting the law, but if you can file a home care application quickly, you, you may not be, you may not have to face the look back period if it's done before October 1st. But we don't know what the future has in, in store after you're found to be eligible October 1st. But this is a really big deal. Families would come in here all the time and say, mom, she's at home, she's got dementia, it's been progressing, but now we think we need somebody in the house. And we would transfer all of mom's assets. It didn't matter who we transferred them to. We could transfer them to a trust. We could transfer them to her spouse, to her kids. And then we would apply for Medicaid. We're not going to be able to do that anymore. So I mentioned before that the Medicaid trust is one of the operative instruments in our practice. And that the changes in the Medicaid laws recently are going to force you to really have to do your planning. The time for waiting is far gone. That's because now you can't even do home care planning without a look back period. So a lot of people would come in and they would say, well, I understand there's a five year look back period for nursing home care, but I'm never going into a nursing home, I'm staying at home. And I can argue with that until I'm blue in the face. But now that same statement applies to home care services. 
And if you really think you're going to stay at home and you don't want to spend all of your money on home care services, we should really be talking about a trust and do the things that, that are necessary to plan for the future. Are there any questions? There's no questions. Okay. We, want, we do want to give contact information okay. though. So we're happy to help. If you want to reach out to us, my email address is smd at mfd-law.com. My website is plantodayfortomorrow.com. The phone number for the Rye office is 925-1010. And the phone number for the Yorktown office is 245-2440. I'm happy to help everyone. We work with young families. If you're a young family, and these are a lot of the calls that we're getting in today. If you're a young family with minor children, there's a whole lot of planning that you need to be doing. God forbid something happens to you and or your spouse, there is, we're going to have problems. And we can help set up your estate by creating trust for your kids and appointing guardians for your kids. There's a lot to do. Please take me up on my offer to help you. And I look forward to seeing you. Have a good day.